everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Just a few years ago, Dear Evan Hansen was, and kind of still is a couple years later, the hit Broadway musical. Now writer Stephen Levinson has brought his brilliance for the pathos of youth to the 60s and revolution. His new play, Days of Rage, tells the story of a group of would-be revolutionaries and the troubles they face as the realistic consequences of their actions begin to threaten the comfort of living in theory. From Days of Rage, please put your hands together for Mike Feist, Tabby Gevinson, J. Alphonse Nicholson, and Lauren Patton. Let's hear it. <laughs> Normally they start clapping as soon as I say the names. I was worried they weren't gonna clap there for a second because it was a really a kind of a delayed response. Um, uh, guys, thanks so much for being here. Congratulations on the show. I caught it a couple weeks ago. I loved it. You're all fantastic in it. And like I was saying in the green room, it's wonderful to see uh, Stephen's writing outside of the musical and outside of the family-friendly world and brought into something a bit more, a bit harsher and a bit more realistic. Uh, it takes place in the uh, late '60s. Uh, it is about, a, uh, like I said, a, a group of youthful potential revolutionaries. How much research did you guys have to feel like you had to do to do your parts? Um, we were all kind of sharing, uh, Stephen had sort of source materials he was sharing with us. There's a, a memoir called With the Weathermen that one of the women who was in the uh, Weather Underground wrote. And uh, we, there's also a great documentary about them. We were all kind of sharing things about the anti-war movement, but also talking a lot about, you know, why it connected with us so much now. Yeah, um, to, you know, chime in on that. Like she, uh, Tavi was saying, shared a lot of information throughout the, um, the rehearsal process. I, I'm not sure who our dramaturg was. I'm sure we had someone, but just bringing a lot of information into the room, Netflix documentaries, all those type of things. But also, yeah, just connecting to 2018 yeah. and realizing how similar the times were and how much has not changed. You know, especially myself being an African American. Um, man and being in, set in that time period in 1969 but being on stage and being in rehearsal and realizing like oh this feels a lot like today <laughs> you know so much of your character's role in the play is kind of confronting these sort of white would-be revolutionaries uh, on their privilege that they have in regards to the roles that they're taking in, in currently in society well you're mm -hmm. a man who's just come back from war and is just trying to live and work and get by in in the society that far more oppresses you than it does them and their the, their comfortable lives. Is that something that you related to now? Well, for sure. And actually, my character, he hadn't been to war. It's his brother. Who was right, excuse war. me, yeah. his brother. And so I, I can relate because I, I, I'm similar to Hal in the fact that I don't think I can change the world, you know, but I do feel like I can say or maybe share a certain perspective in a small room, in a room with a group of people that hopefully, hopefully opens someone's perspective and you can share it with your neighbor, share it with your grandchild, your son, your daughter, and eventually it'll grow into something larger. Uh, so I think how he does his best to kind of just make it through his day to day, but at the same time, making sure he takes advantage to share his thoughts with these people as awkward as it may be or as intense the situation may be. He said, I, you know, let me, have a platform and try to use it in a small way. So I can relate to that for sure. You know, one of the aspects of the uh, of the play that I was fascinated by is that there was this feeling at this time that there was a means to exist outside of a system. And I think for the most part, all of us feel like there is no means to exist outside of the system now. No matter what you do, you have to be within the system itself. So there's no revolutionary idea anymore of actually destroying the system or taking it down because it's just too big and swallows everything no matter how revolutionary or disruptive that piece may be. What was it like for you as young people playing these parts and playing these people who really felt like they could destroy and change the system? I mean, I think... When we were doing research about the time, right, I think something that stuck out to us and I know um, was really interesting to Stephen, our playwright, was that that time period, the late 60s before it turned into the 70s, was maybe the last time that people truly felt like they could dismantle the system and build up a completely new system. Um, after that, uh, we haven't really seen that sort of sentiment in a movement since. but. You know, at the same time, I think we're um, 
in a time period now where there's a lot of talk, whether it's there's truthful talk about it, and there's also political rhetoric about it of, um, you know, we all know the phrase draining the swamp by now, um, of this thought of uh, taking down the system as it currently is and building it back up into something else. And um, so much of what interests me about this play and then about our time now is how that gets warped and is used as something different. Um, and I think what happens in the play is because these people do completely take themselves out of their surroundings and their community and uh, the system. And they're sort of just um, ricocheting these ideas off of each other of what they believe is right. And so it gets warped into this kind of thing that actually isn't grounded in reality anymore. And that's what Hal does when he comes into this group and sort of is confronted with it as he's this voice of reality and reason. And it, it, it's interesting to see how the people that are within the political collective end up living in this kind of bubble because they've insulated themselves with their ideas. Well, they themselves end up warping those ideas as well. Mike, I think your character himself, whether it's intentional or not, in order to maintain some kind of control, which is clearly a comment on patriarchy at that time and now, ends up kind of warping the ideas so that he can have a somewhat con somewhat of a control on the women that he's living with. Well, I, I, I'm not sure if it's necessarily to have control over the individuals, but maybe control, um, it's more of an unconscious kind of level of just um, having control over my situation in this moment and being, you know, um, unrealistically hopeful with what I'm actually able to accomplish. Um, and, I, and I think the only way to maybe get by in a certain situation by that is to just keep feeding you, yourself the things that you need to hear in order to keep going. And I think that we do that um, when whatever kind of situation we are, how desperate it is. This is your second time working with uh, Steven. You were in the original cast of uh, Dear Evan Hansen. What's it like coming back with him? Uh, it's the best. I just, I mean, I, this entire time, I just keep telling people, like, if I can just do Steven Levinson plays, then I'm good. <laughs> That's all I need. Did he come to you? Did he say, I'm writing this? And I, I think no, he'd be not great at for all. It? No, because we, well, we were talking about this. <clears throat> I auditioned, and um, he was saying, like, you know, I've only seen you as like one person for four years. And I had no idea you could be someone else, maybe, <laughs> kind of a situation. So, yeah. Well, and Stephen actually wrote this play for the first time in, was it 2009? When he, so he, this is um, an older play for him that he's been sort of bouncing around for a long time. Uh, so yeah, it wasn't like he, it was way before Dear Evan Hansen. And, um, so it sort of holds a special place in his heart, but he also wasn't writing it for anybody necessarily. It was just um, a time period and ideas that really uh, held strongly with him. Abby, your character is kind of a psychopath <laughs> sociopath yes you think a sociopath i think so yes really <laughs> yeah what was it like playing a sociopath um such a good question um does it look fun yeah, in a it's way it's really fun it's like well at first it was hard because i'd be like so why am i doing this and trip our director would just be like because you're a sociopath <laughs> and you're like okay but i can't play it's not very rewarding for me or the audience dramatically if everything is just a means to an end, like a lot of people who are manipulative, and Peggy's also quite young, so she may not be aware of it, but they don't know that they're, they genuinely think what's best for them is what's best for everyone, and so it was easier to think of it in terms of like, yes, overall she's selfish and she has a cynical end game in mind, but it's also, but it comes from a place of being quite troubled and neglected in her life back home and, um, and traumatized and also like wanting to genuinely be a part of something. I think the collective is already very dysfunctional by the time she gets there. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of, there are, you know, with Hal too, these other, and then with Peggy, like these forces just bring out what um, the three in the collective can't really face when it's just them. Um, That's such an interesting thing that you bring up, this idea of wanting to know why your character does something, but then having to trust that the director and writer really know that even though it may not, they may not have a clear reason as to why, it will make sense and it will register for the audience, even if it doesn't register for your tracking as an actor. Yeah, I think, I mean, I've had, some people have, come up to me and been like, 
did she really believe in the revolution? Um, oh, I believe that she did. I thought that she did, yeah. Yeah, I think, but I like that it could feel ambiguous because, you know, there is a, you do call into question the whole thing at the end. And I think, um, but uh, in terms of research, I was also reading about, like, people in 60s counterculture who were pretty apolitical but kind of conflated revolution with, like, we just want to do a lot of drugs and we hate our parents, like the factory people and um, Andy Warhol's factory. And, uh, yeah, that, that's more like Peggy's background. It was amazing when it didn't have to be revolutionary and we could just do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Lauren, your character is kind of this uh, character that's sort of on the fence about the whole thing, a representative of, of um, moderate, of being, of being somewhat of a moderate, even though she's a revolutionary. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the thing about my character Jenny is that she comes to being radicalized through um, a really deep sense of empathy for the really terrible, inhumane things that were going on with the Vietnam War. And one of my favorite parts of the play is um, Stephen wrote this monologue in a scene that I have with Hal where I'm talking about... Um, the fact that I just felt like once I learned what was actually happening in Vietnam, it felt like I couldn't do nothing. That it, it felt insane to just do absolutely nothing. Um, and I think that's where Jenny really comes from. And a lot of what happens for her as the collective gets more insular and more uh, radicalized in a way that isn't connected to um, that empathy and to that um, struggle against inhumanity, um, her connection to the movement starts to uh, become frayed. And I think um, what Stephen has written, which is so beautiful, is this question of whether it's possible to overthrow something as huge as a system or to create that kind of big of change and to be radical in that way and still keep your humanity. Because a lot of people start, um, most people start these revolutions because they really care about what's going on in the world and they want to create a change and it's connected to other people's suffering. But then if you get to a place where it's so insular and you lose connection with that, then you can start causing harm yourself. And I think that's where Jenny is on the fence is she can't quite get on board with causing harm in the name of a better world or uh, you know, lesser of evils kind of a thing. So it's a very interesting question I think Stephen brings up that um, means a lot to me as a young person walking through this time in our country too. The reality of a revolutionary overthrow of a government and power and right. the theory and the play's kind of always, the characters of the play are always sort of bumping up against those two things. Well, because right. you kind of end up becoming the very thing that you want to destroy. Yeah. Right. Once you get power. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you and Alphonse have a... Um, have a wonderful romantic scene with each other. Uh, and I, I, I bring it up not because like, oh, you kissed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but because it's wonderfully written and it's a rarity to actually have romantic moments, I think, uh, in, in straight plays these days. And as, as well, in a play like this, you wouldn't expect it. Can you talk about developing that scene with each other? Because it, it lands really well and it's nice to have this like, bit of romance in the, in the middle of this play. Yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll start speak on it. Um, you know, as you... Some of you may know this is a new play, so it changed, you know, constantly and how. Really developing it. You yeah. You wrote it in 2009. You guys were changing it during rehearsals and stuff. He changed it a ton in rehearsals up until the day we opened. You know, we had constant changes, and that's the great thing about working with people who are so talented that people can just adjust and keep it moving. But uh, it's just been so great working with this cast and building that relationship with Lauren. What I really like about it, um, for one, is just the you know, the, the racial aspect of it and how I don't think people are quite expecting it at first. And for my character, how I don't think he quite expects it for himself, you know, in 1969 to be attracted to this young white woman and the dangers of that. And, you know, so that was some of the conversation behind that. What does this mean to be attracted to someone of the uh, opposite race, um, you know, during a time that could actually cause you harm? And so for me, it was wonderful building that and being vulnerable and open to her and finding someone that he could share his thoughts and, and process, you know, everything that he was going through with. And we just found these really beautiful moments where it was, it was funny and it was, it was connecting. 
And what I like about it is just it's two humans connecting on a real level and taking each other in, no matter what the flaws may be. You know, because Hal obviously has his flaws as well and how he sees things, and he sees that in Jenny. And I think that's something that he connects to in a real way. And that's why <clears throat> it comes off so naturally and real on stage because that happens in real life, you know? Yeah, I think it's really, um, it's really special in a play when you can just have a scene where it's two characters sitting and talking, yeah. you know? And it's, it's, um, it's really about the relationship and that that can land and people and it's interesting and people are drawn in and want to watch it because of course you have to have action and plot and things happening and there's plenty of that in this play where we're running around and freaking out but to have a moment in the play where we don't move at all we just sit on a bench and talk and um I think that that really highlights as we're talking about, you know, the, this notion of losing humanity and if you, you know, if you can keep your humanity while you're doing these radical things and I think that's a moment for Jenny where for the first time in a long time she just has a human connection with somebody and feels seen and sees somebody else um, and and it's a beautiful romantic moment and then it, it becomes tragic as um, you know as that as everything else gets in the way of that and eventually not spoil things but it doesn't work because um, because of Spoiled. everything else. No. <laughs> Sorry, now I guess you don't have to come see it. No, right. you should come see it. Uh, Mike, you know, uh, you and Tavi have this wonderful arc where she kind of becomes the powerful one in the situation and you have no idea how to handle her anymore. Where, uh -huh. Yeah, it's really great. It's, a, it's wonderful to watch that uh, play out. Can you talk about building this arc where eventually you just have no control over <laughs> over the situation that you thought you had control over? I, I think that's just Tavi's performance, you know, and seeing, watching her um, go from this, what we think is this sweet girl who just wants to, like, have a place to crash, and then her slow evolution into this powerful person who's outspoken and she's just you know that's just her performance you know she's just fantastic yeah i think you're pretty My. great as well in in, in I, playing off of her well she's that's all her i'm just <laughs> you know Mike. what i mean i'm just listening and i'm like wow that's good mike just admit that you're good at being emasculated <laughs> Is that what the Just fear is here? Is that why you're being so <laughs> humble? You don't want to talk about your own emasculation? Uh, we should also say that uh, Stephen gives you uh, really one of the great kickers of a, of a play right now in the last act. I don't want to reveal what that is lot, or spoil yeah. it, but it's such a wonderful crowd-pleasing moment where you know every playwright, playwright tries to do that. Every play, it's like a rule of a play that you have to do, but it's a rarity that it actually works so well that everybody in the audience goes wild for it. And Everybody, I would imagine, every time you perform the show goes crazy for that moment, do they? It is, it's nice to have a moment where you're like, I know that this will land. Yeah. Like, even if like, you know, it's a, not every audience has the same sense of humor or whatever, but it's a, it's a, it's a good reveal. It's pretty reliable. It's one of those reveals that there's gonna be one guy in the audience at least like, ah! <laughs> and you'll be able to hear that from the stage. Yes. <laughs> uh, let's get some questions uh, from our audience. Who's the question? Hi. Right here. I wanted to know from each of you, um, what do you want your audience to take away from Days of Rage? Like, what's the biggest thing you want them to take away from it? I'll start, so I won't have to go last. But uh, <laughs> uh, thanks for the question. For me, uh, I'm one of those artists who I want you to take whatever you, you get from it. You know, whatever you learn, whatever you hear, take something. You know, don't just come there and sit and hear the show and come to judge it, you know, like, oh, whether you think it's great, whether you think it's awful, go home and try to spark a conversation, whether it's with yourself or with a loved one or with someone of an opposite um, creed or a gender or race, whatever it may be. Just be sure to allow it to absorb something. And I think that's the biggest thing for me, and especially with the content that I have to deal with, with my character, how I stand up there every night and perform in front of a 98% white audience. And so for me, it's I pray and I hope that you see me and that you have some something going through your head and say, maybe I can do something to help this, whether it's a conversation or me just 
processing some thoughts for myself and who I am and how I connect to people who don't look like me. Yeah. Mike? I don't want to rest. No, I, I just think that is it. I think Stephen with this, I mean, theater in general, you know, I think has the power to create empathy for, you know, people that maybe we don't really see eye to eye with or we don't actually connect with that person, but because we're able to see them in this imaginary space, I don't know, all guards are dropped for everyone. And so we're able to create empathy. And, um, you know, I just think that that's, it, that's obviously it, you know, is we just want the audience to kind of be taken away, um, not feeling like they aren't capable of reaching across and speaking to someone, you know. I think for me, um, I've been thinking a lot in the last two or so years about um, intellectual bubbles, you know, and I think a lot of us had the experience um, with our current climate in the country of wondering like, who, what am I missing? What, have, what did I not know? Whose experience did I not know or think about? And I think that a lot of times in this play, um, you see people who have good intentions and want to reach across and connect to somebody and for whatever reason can't because they're so wrapped up in the things that are already making sense in their head. And so for me, I think that underneath the politics of the play, underneath all of that, it's just about um, this notion of having to listen to other people. And uh, that to me is what I remember from doing this play. And I would say that's probably what I hope that audience members take away from it too is um, the willingness to to listen and keep our empathy. Um, you're all so smart and great <laughs> that I'll give something really specific and weird, which is that the 60s get really romanticized. Like, it's like for many years, I think I just pictured the movie Almost Famous and like that one Jefferson Airplane song or whatever. And uh, our, you know, people who see theater in New York are mostly older, maybe lived through the 60s, and mostly white. And uh, I think it's, um, I think this play re-examines parts of the anti-war revolution and can maybe remind audience members that it wasn't, um, you know, the left is not a monolith, like there were nuances to that movement and not all of them were um, flattering like some of them were, you know, and that's also what progress is, is like it's baby steps and sometimes it's one step forward, two steps back. And um, I, I think the characters in this play are flawed and human. And um, a lot of that comes out in their politics. So I, if, on top of everything else, um, when I look out during the show, I, uh, oh, I'm, I'm eager to know what's kind of going through the minds of, of people who uh, consider, who idealize that time. I hope that it can be re-examined a bit. I wonder about this time comparatively, if like in 30 or 40 years, people will look back on 2018 and there'll be one rant, like the culture will somehow say, it was so great. There was great music, you know, or, or something. And we'll all kind of be like, no, it was hell. The earth was on fire and we were terrified. The president was crazy. And like, no, it was great. A Star is Born came out that year. I loved it or something I'm like, what? Anyway, I think question. we're all wondering what the history books are going to say about 2018. <laughs> or if there will be history books after 2018. <laughs> Next question. Hi. Um, what's it like playing a character in a time period you weren't alive for? Mm. I'll start again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, for me, it's one of those things where, yeah, you always think about, like, my mother was born in 1965, so she didn't quite grow up. You know, she was, she did, she was five by the time this place, you know, 1969. But growing up, I was always like, ah, I wonder what that was like, you know? I wonder what it was like. And then you do a play like this, and it's like, man, it's very similar to today, actually. Unfortunately, yes, people aren't getting sprayed down with water hose and dogs thrown on them, but the type of conversations that you see happen in Days of Rays, especially with my character and other characters, happens every day. And the way I'm judged and the way I, you look at the world is very similar to 2018. So 
it's like, man, okay, maybe it's not much different, or maybe a lot that much time hasn't passed, or maybe that much hasn't changed. Um, the clothes are really nice, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I'm glad that type of stuff is coming back in style, you know. But other than <laughs> yeah, other than that, it it feels oddly very similar, you know. Yeah, I think the m most important thing to remember is Stephen wrote this play in 2009 right after Obama got elected, and this idea of change was up in the ether, you know? And um, I think Stephen's written a wonderful play where, you know, it can be transported through time and kind of still be relevant, or it still be re-examined, at least, to ask continuous questions, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, ultimately, you have to know what you're talking about when you're talking about things like, you know, the 1968 Democratic Convention and things like I can't be on stage talking about historic events and not have researched that and asked questions and know what that means to the character. But ultimately, people are people. And, um, you know, we had the same uh, struggles and feelings and connections that we can and do in 2018. So as far as the real root of what I'm doing, it doesn't really matter what time period it's in. We'll get a great costume designer to make us look like we're in 1969, and then we'll go from there. Yeah. Oh, I don't have anything <laughs> to add. That was good. Yes. No, go anything. with that. No one yeah. ever does that on this stage. That makes me so happy that you're just so I would be honest. wasting your time. That is fantastic. Thank you. I'm going to clip that and put it in my own personal reel of something sick. <laughs> nah, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Uh, last question. Hi. Um, a lot of you just answered the question that I have, but I think I can phrase it differently that maybe it'll still be interesting. Um, I know you just said I was going to ask, how would your characters respond to um, the political situation today? But but you just said... That's different. Our characters are now... How old, is, how old is Jenny now? Make me do math. <laughs> I want to do math. I think our characters... I think Spence is maybe... 71. He's got some tenure yeah, as a professor yeah, and yeah. everything. Yeah, Isn't sure. that mentioned at some... Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. But, uh, I mean, I think uh, it's interesting to think about what if these characters were growing up? You know, what, what if they were born in the 90s and, com you know, coming of age, going to college and stuff during this time? Um... You know, it's 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 interesting. It's funny. It's weird to imagine it. Um, I think that, I mean, I'll say that I'm heartened. It's interesting doing this play, playing twenty year olds who are, this is their response to um, the horrors that they see in their world and at their time, and I see, young people in our time doing that right now as well, and in a really humane way that is trying to make connections. Um, I think. To me, I think a lot about the students from Parkland and what they're doing with their experience and the absolute horror they've had to go through. And uh, by doing it in a way that is making sure you're reaching out and connecting with people rather than I'm going to take myself out of the world and um, throw around a bunch of ideas in this whirlpool and not talk to anybody from any other side about it and see how that goes. Um, you know, who knows how Jenny or Spence, you know, would react now, but I think that the fact that we have young people who are reacting in that way um, is one of, <laughs> not to be sad, but like one of the only sources of real hope that I hold on to at this point in time because it's so heartening to me. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, we'll keep it with that. We'll stick with that. Yeah. Uh, you guys, uh, I love the play. It's up for another week, right? Uh, at the Second yeah. Stage Theater on, like, the 46th? 43rd. 43rd. And 8th Ave. And 8th Ave. It's wonderful. Go see it. You've got one more week to do it, so get off your asses and go see it, because they are fantastic in it, and it's a great play. Give them a big round of applause. Let's hear it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.